Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today. I'm a new urologist in uh, Kelowna. I started about, I guess, 11 and a half months ago. And I did um, some fellowship training in neurourology and reconstructive urology. So hopefully today, uh, I hope to discuss some of the mechanisms of bladder dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. I'd like to talk a little bit about your dynamic findings and what we look for as urologists in patients with Parkinson's disease. Talk some uh, a little bit about the treatments for bladder dysfunction in Parkinson's disease, as well as our urological surveillance guidelines for patients with uh, bladder dysfunction, uh, particularly with Parkinson's disease. But also, we'll we'll touch on some neurologic disorders in general, and then I'll briefly discuss the bowel dysfunction. But my expertise is not in that area, so um, hopefully, you'll get something out of the bladder dysfunction component of the talk. It's interesting because I always get paged for neurology when I'm on call. So I'm sure that you guys get paged for urology on call uh, whenever you're covering the hospital as well. It always gives a sigh of relief. So um, bladder dysfunction is one of the most common autonomic disorders in Parkinson's disease. Unlike uh, motor disorders, bladder dysfunction is not responsive to levodopa, suggesting that this dysfunction can occur through a complex pathophysiological mechanism. The lower urinary tract depicted in figure B consists of two major components, the bladder and the urethra. The bladder has an abundance of M3, M2 receptors, their muscarinic receptors, and beta-3 adrenergic receptors. And these are innervated by the parasympathetic cholinergic system and the noradrenergic sympathetic systems. And so what's important to note, I always think of parasympathetic to P, so PP. So parasympathetic uh, causes contraction of the bladder, allowing you to, to void or to pee. So that's the way I think about it. The other component of the lower urinary tract is the urethra. And this has abundance of the alpha 1A and uh, D receptors and nicotinic receptors. It's innervated by the noradrenergic or sympathetic system and the cholinergic or somatic system. And so it's important to note, there's two phases of, of um, the bladder function uh, and the, the um, urethra function. One is storage of urine and one is voiding uh, um, during the voiding phase. During the storage phase, the bladder is uh, relaxed and the urethra is closed and contracted. And during the voiding phase, the bladder is contracting and the urethra is open. So when we look at the regulation of micturition or voiding, it requires connections between many areas between the brain and the spinal cord and involves both the sympathetic or all the sympathetic, parasympathetic and somatic systems. So the lower urinary tract functions uh, two oppositive ways, one involving the storage depicted in A and the emptying of urine. In normal urine storage, it's dependent on the, the spinal cord and the storage reflex is thought to be tonically facilitated by the brain, particularly the pontine storage center. And this is where the bladder is normally for 99% for of the time is in this storage phase. The pontine storage center lies just ventral lateral to the pontine micturition center. When micturition occurs uh, less frequently than the storage phase, it's dependent on the brainstem, autonomic reflex, and involves the midbrain, periaqueductal gray matter, and the PMC. The PEG is thought to be central in regulating micturition up here. And it's important as it, it takes in information from a range of higher structures. The PMC is located adjacent to the locus coeruleum. The PMC is thought to project spinal cord, spinal fibers to activate the sacral bladder, preganglionic nucleus, and sacral urethral motor nucleus. So important in, in triggering um, uh, micturition. So what are some of the brain areas that are involved in regulating the storage of urine? Well, the hypothalamus and the prefrontal cortex are important in voiding function, while the hypothalamus, cerebellum, basal ganglia, and frontal cortex are important in storage function. The voiding function functions initiated and facilitated by higher brain structures, particularly the hypothalamus and prefrontal cortex, and this overlaps with the storage facilitating areas. <clears throat> 
So in neurogenic bladder, we get something called diffuser overactivity, and this can lead to symptoms of urgency, frequency, as well as incontinence in patients. It's very pertinent to Parkinson's disease. In lesions above the brainstem, the micturition reflex arc is intact. So it's actually an intact system. And this diffuser overactivity is considered to be exaggerated micturition reflex. This may be due to decreased inhibition of the brain, including further facilitation by glutamaric and D2 dopaminergic mechanisms. So as I alluded to, dopamine transmitters imaging have been found to be lower in Parkinson's patients with urinary dysfunction than those without. And in Parkinson's disease, the disruption of the D1 GABAergic direct pathway, which inhibits the basal ganglia output nucleus, may inhibit the micturition reflex, leading to detrusive overactivity and frequency and urgency. Furthermore, the frontal cortex is also important in micturition. It's the highest center for micturition. And in studies, they found that women with urgency incontinence show frontal deactivation when compared to control subjects. The frontal cortex has direct fiber connections with the hypothalamus and the peg, and it may regulate the micturition versus the basal ganglia cir circuit. So why are these mechanisms important? Because in Parkinson's disease, it's commonly associated with non-motor symptoms, including neuropsychiatric disturbances, sleep disorders, and autonomic symptoms, as you know. Lower urinary tract symptoms are the most common autonomic dysfunction seen in Parkinson's patients in 75% of patients. And these symptoms can have a severe consequence on patients' quality of life, particularly if, if there's incontinence involved. Also nocturia. So as urologist, what do we find in this patient population? Well, we use a study called urodynamics, which I'll talk a little bit in more detail. Parkinson's patients <coughs> can have, can Parkinson's disease can result in this detrusive overactivity during bladder filling when the bladder is being filled up during the urodynamic study in the majority of patients. Detrusive overactivity correlates with the stage of Parkinson's disease and may and becomes more prevalent as the disease advances. advances. You get both storage symptoms. So when the bladder is storing urine, you get symptoms of urgency, frequency, nocturia, and incontinence. And you also get voiding symptoms. So when the patient goes to void, they feel hesitancy. They can't empty their bladder and initiating a stream. They get an interrupted or poor stream and they feel the need to, to double void. And this is, these are the symptoms that are reported in Parkinson's disease. The severity of lower urinary tract symptoms increases with the progression of Parkinson's disease and parallels that of other autonomic dysfunction disorders. So this is what I was alluding to. This is a study that we do in um, urology, urodynamics. And in this study, we place catheters in the bladder and the rectum, and we measure the abdominal pressure from the rectum and the bladder pressure from the urethral catheter. When we subtract these, you can see how much the detrusor or the muscle of the bladder is contracting. So the purpose of this study is to identify bladder storage and voiding conditions responsible for patient's symptoms. It's helpful in the diagnosis, pathophysiology, treatment, prognosis, and surveillance of patients with this and other diseases. This is an example tracing of what we would read from a urodynamic study. There are two phases of urodynamics that are important. One is the storage. So this is called the systometrogram where we fill the bladder and we can, we can while we're filling the bladder, record the patient's sensation to void, how big the bladder is known as capacity, how compliant the bladder is to filling. Is it a fixed bladder that can't fill easily or is it a bladder that actually can expand when it's being filled? how well the contraction is, and if patients leak or have continence issues. The second phase of the aerodynamics is the voiding phase. And in this phase, we can see um, how much the, the patient has voided and what is left in their bladder. And also how much pressure is it, is it required to empty the bladder? Are they actually able to empty it? That's a pressure flow study. And lastly, the electromyography or EMG, it's actually important to see if when the bladder goes to contract, if the sphincter is actually coordinated and relaxes at that time, or if it's working against the bladder and contracting at the same time. 
So we use this urodynamics and what we visualize in the Parkinson's disease population is often this detrusor overactivity I speak of. And this is just an example tracing where we see a large peak here in the the pressure of the detrusor muscle. We can see that this is not something that the patient has tried to do, but the bladder has actually had a contraction without the patient wanting it to. And this is known as detrusor activity. And at that time, we can characterize how bad it is and if it's associated with a leak. This is a little bit of a messy urodynamic um, tracing, but it's important to note that, as I mentioned, in these patients during the um, uh, the, the voiding phase, they can also get what's called hesitancy. So they can't initiate a flow and they can get intermittency. So that means they're getting an intermittent flow as they go to void. And so what you see in this channel, this flow channel, they have a low tiny peak for flow. And then in the detrusor channel, they're really pushing to get that out, but yet there's no flow being, being uh, delivered. So these are two of the features that we often, often see in these Parkinson's disease patients. So now that we know a little bit about some of the urologic um, manifestations of Parkinson's disease, I wanted to switch gears and talk about some of the treatments that are available for these patients within this context. Parkinson's drugs and the lower urinary tract symptoms, when we look at these, we know that it's unclear if levodopa has any effect on the urinary tract system. In an logistic regression analysis of over 3,000 patients found that urodynamic sim or sorry, urinary symptoms were often not responsive to levodopa therapy, as I alluded to at the beginning of the talk. And when we look at dopamine agonists and the data um, in this regard, there was a questionnaire study reporting that the avoiding symptoms were more common in patients taking levodopa and bromocryptine than those taking levodopa alone. So there may be some evidence that affects uh, avoiding symptoms there. And with the um, MAO-B inhibitors, we don't have any understanding of how this Parkinson's disease drug affects the lower urinary tract symptoms. When we look at lower urinary tract drugs on the effect of Parkinson's patients, there are many different categories we look at. Anticholinergics, beta-3 agonists, botulinum toxin, alpha blockers, and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And these all work at different levels within the bladder to affect the, um, the micturition and storage pathways. So when we look at drugs that are used in the storage phase, that's ones that relax the bladder and prevent detrusor overactivity, urgency, frequency, and incontinence. The, mo the most commonly used drugs are anticholinergics, and these are inhibiting the M2, M3 receptors. They're safe and effective in neurogenic detrusor overactivity, um, but there is, there is a concern in terms of cognitive related adverse events. Furthermore, when you put patients on these anticholinergics, as you know, it can affect many different other systems, such as uh, um, most commonly constipation and dry mouth being very common side effects. The most commonly used anticholinergics are tolteridine, oxybutyn, and solafenacin. And theoretically, trospium is very important because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So as I alluded to with anticholinergics, there is some data to suggest that um, those people that take anticholinergics can have cognitive side effects, especially those in the elderly. So trospium would have a theoretically reduced risk of cognitive impairment. But in an exploratory analysis by Welk, they didn't see a difference significantly in the risk of dementia based on the type of anticholinergic used. So in my patient population, I usually start with beta-3 agonists, and that's purely because of the side effect profile and the fact that patients um, have a possible cognitive impairment with the anticholinergics, both of which have efficacy in this patient population, but um, beta-3 agonists are usually my go-to. In studies, they've shown that in about 100 patients with Parkinson's re randomized to Mirbetric, um, which is the only Canadian, uh, sorry, only um, beta-3 agonist available in Canada versus placebo, those who received Mirbetric have significantly improved symptom scores, but slightly increased post-void residual volumes compared to placebo. And those post-void residual volumes probably were not clinically significant. <laughs> 
In Welk's study, there was an increased risk of dementia found with um, anticholinergic users as compared to beta-3 agonist users. So again, that's why I generally start with the beta-3 agonist users, particularly as patients with Parkinson's are often elderly, so they're at higher risk of developing this dementia down the road. There was a significant effect modification based on both gender and age. Men and those aged less than 75 on anticholinergics had the highest rate of dementia relative to beta-3 agonist users. Interestingly, less than 75 years. So overall, Merbetric is effective in treating OAB symptoms or Dutruzo or activity symptoms in patients with Parkinson's with accept acceptable adverse events. And when we think of the side effects of Merbegron or beta-3 agonists, it's important to note that those patients that have high blood pressure should be warned that it may elevate their blood pressure by 5 to 10 degrees, and that should be monitored. And again, there are side effects of dry mouth and constipation. In the studies, there was also a higher post-void residual in patients, but generally this is not something that is clinically, uh, clinically significant. So... Um, in patients that fail merbetric or anticholinergics, beta-3 agonists or anticholinergics, or do not have um, improved quality of life to the point that they're satisfied, these patients are candidates for coverage, uh, covered intravesical botulinum toxin injections to treat in, in, intractable detrusive overactivity in Parkinson's disease. Okay, so this is... Um, a botulinum toxin that produces paralysis by blocking the presynaptic uh, release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction with reversible chemical denervation of the muscle fiber. Therefore, it al allows for a partial paralysis and atrophy of the muscle of the bladder wall. Efficacy is quite good. It's better than both um, mirbetric and anti, sorry, beta-3 agonists and anticholinergics in combination as well in studies. 79% have shown improvement in urgency and continence symptoms, and 29% have complete resolution of symptoms. There is a 12.5% risk of needing intermittent catheterization for approximately two week period for urinary retention post-procedure, so that's very important when counseling patients. But this is a good option for patients that really have uh, symptoms that are, are uh, quite um, intractable. Of note, in terms of to have coverage, you have to have tried an anticholinergic and a beta-3 agonist in Canada or in British Columbia in order to have it covered um, through special authority. So what about drugs and treatments for voiding lower urinary tract symptoms? So that's patients with the hesitancy, uh, intermittent flow, inability to empty and needing to double void. So in, the, in these patients, uh, we use alpha blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and then some go on to surgery, the transurethral resection of the prostate. Parkinson's disease is most likely to affect men um, uh, compared to women, and the incidence of Parkinson's disease increases with age. Well, benign prostatic enlargement or benign prostatic hyperplasia is also a disease of, of older men. Uh, and so we use, we use treatments for benign prostatic enlargement in these populations very frequently, alpha blockers and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and surgeries such as the transuth resection of the prostate. Interestingly, they showed in a study that terazosin, which is an alpha blocker that relaxes the urethra, allowing the bladder to empty better, um, uh, it's used to treat benign prostatic enlargement. It's recently been discovered to enhance glycolysis and reduce Parkinson's progression in animal models. And in a cohort of about 52,000 people, um, a propensity uh, score matched pairs of terazosin, doxazosin, alfuzosin, and tamsulosin users. It was found that the use of terazosin, doxazosin, and alfuzosin are at a lower hazard, a lower hazard of developing Parkinson's disease compared to the use users of tamsulosin. So in general, as urologists, we often prescribe tamsulosin or Flomax as the first line, but perhaps we should be cautioned and be prescribing patients with Parkinson's disease with one of these other agents instead. When we look at the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors in Parkinson's disease, it's really only been studied in animal models, so I can't comment on that today. <clears throat> 
The transurethral resection of the prostate in, is, is one of the most common surgeries we, we do as urologists for benign prostatic enlargement. Well, what's the importance in Parkinson's disease patients? Well, in studies of Parkinson's patients, continence can be restored in 50% of patients with the transurethral resection of the prostate. And there's been no cases in the studies reported of de novo or um, the new onset of incontinence post TERP. 70% of patients have improved quality of life after TERP. And I think it's important to note that this is a good option for patients with de or, or sorry, with um, hesitancy and inability to empty their bladder and Parkinson's disease. But it's important to do the urodynamic studies to get the appropriate diagnosis and ensure that it's not to choose over activity, but instead it's an obstruction issue uh, before moving to TERP. And that's because benign prostatic enlargement surgery should not be done in patients with multiple system atrophy because this is a more progressive disorder. As you all know, it's a disease that simulates Parkinson's disease, but it's more progressive and can lead to urinary retention. In early stages of MSA, it's difficult to differentiate between Parkinson's disease, and several studies have shown that severe symptom, symptomatic automatic failure, including urinary incontinence, may be a, a prognostic indicator of survival in MSA. Urinary incontinence rarely improves with a, a prostate surgery in MSA, unlike that as in Parkinson's patients. Urodynamic differentiation is key so when a patient comes with Parkinson's disease, it's very important to do urodynamics really to weed out those with MSA because they have a lower maximal flow, higher post void residuals and decreased compliance and impaired contractility compared to Parkinson's disease. To choose their overactivity and urinary leakage is associated with DO um, and is more prominent in patients with Parkinson's disease. The bottom line is that in Parkinson's disease and MSA, they both get to choose over activity, but in MSA, they get incomplete bladder emptying that's more um, uh, substantial. So as I suggested in this tracing where we look at um, during the filling phase, the systometrogram, we see in both patient populations that there's evidence of this detuser overactivity where the detuser's contracting without the patient wanting it to. But in MSA, there's also incomplete bladder emptying. So in the top corner, you can see a euro flow and a post void residual. So the post void residual will be higher and the flow will be guarded. And in a pressure flow study, you have a low flow, high pressure, a more often MSA. And that's been found in um, uh, this study by Shin in 2019, where they actually correlated the findings in MSA compared to Parkinson's disease. And really the MSA patients had difficulties emptying. So lastly, I wanted to touch on surveillance of bladder dysfunction in Parkinson's patients. And we really use the Canadian Urology um, Urologic Association guidelines. And this was put out a couple of years ago by Dr. Kavanaugh et al. And it, it allows for us to look at the diagnosis, management, and surveillance of neurogenic lower, lower urinary tract dysfunction. So I'll speak to it in terms of um, Parkinson's disease, but also in general, it's a good guideline as neurologists. Um, to know when to refer to urology or when to have a conversation back and forth. So this is a pertinent figure where we risk stratify patients with neurologic disease into those with high risk versus those with low risk disease. And what the risk really is, is to see if there's any chance of the kidneys deteriorating from hydronephrosis or backup. And so high pressure bladders, are consistently associated with patients with spina bifida and spinal cord injury, as well as advanced multiple sclerosis. So in those, those are the higher risk patients. More uh, commonly, uh, we do very active uh, follow-up, such as urodynamics, uh, renal ultrasound and renal function, at least on an annual basis, if not um, more frequent than that. Whereas Parkinson's disease is often considered low risk because patients have trouble with the choose over activity, but generally the upper tracts are not compromised by this. At some times when they're obstructed, there is a chance of deteriorating the upper tracts. And that's really when we, we transfer these patients from low risk to high risk category. And so those are patients with higher uh, post-void residuals, 
bothersome incontinence if they're getting frequent infections or they're needing to use catheters to manage their bladder or they have known high risk features like a small bladder, then we, we move them more to a higher risk category. So for the most part, most Parkinson's patients are in the low risk category. So that means yearly evaluation with the general practitioner or family physician, the physiatrist, the neurologist, or the urologist. Yearly renal function in select cases, particularly those that have uh, hesitancy and inability to empty, they should probably be monitored with uh, renal imaging yearly or those that get recurrent UTIs. So why refer patients for urological evaluation um, when they have Parkinson's disease? When they have new onset or worsening incontinence, when they have new uh, frequent urinary infections, new onset catheter issues, for example, uh, penile urethra erosion, incrustation, bypassing, renal bladder imaging changes such as upper or lower tract ur urinary tract deterioration, hydronephrosis or having a high PVR, or significant increase in PVR or new stone disease. So in conclusion, I hopefully was able to go over some information today and I'm happy to take questions. Parkinson's disease can result in detrusor overactivity and incontinence. It can also lead to hesitancy, intermittent flow and inability to empty in some patients. Detrusor overactivity can be diagnosed based on history. So that's urgency, frequency, as well as incontinence. And it can also be diagnosed based on your euro urodynamic investigation. So when during the filling phase, there's detrusor activity <coughs> when it's unwanted by the patient. The importance of this is really in the patient's quality of life. How is this really affecting the patient's quality of life? And that determines best treatment options for patients. So it is safe um, in patients with bladder dysfunction and Parkinson's disease to use anticholinergics, beta-3 agonists, and botulinum toxin. And those are really to calm the bladder, bladder relaxants for the detrusor overactivity and incontinence component. It's important to rule out MSA before offering Parkinson's patients a surgical intervention such as benign prosthetic enlargement. And that's purely because we know in Parkinson's disease that there's good efficacy and good quality of life outcomes in patients with benign prosthetic enlargement. But in MSA, that's not true, that in fact, um, some patients end up with incontinence. And despite your best efforts to treat the benign prosthetic enlargement, likely they'll still be symptomatic after surgery, putting them at undue risk. Parkinson's patients have bladder dysfunction, should have early yearly evaluation and possible renal imaging. And the imaging is really reserved for those with high PVRs, uh, history of stones, recurrent infections. And then just to go a little into bowel dysfunction, the entire gastrointestinal tract is affected in these patients causing complications that range from oral issues, including drooling, swallowing problems, to delays in gastric emptying and constipation. Additionally, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and H. pylori infections affect motor fluctuations by interfering with the absorption of anti-Parkinsonian drugs. And I, I, I suggest that if you want to learn a little bit about how Parkinson's uh, disease affects the gastrointestinal tract that you um, I can read this Lancet neuro Neurology article by uh, Fasano, and, ha and they go through the details of how it affects the submandibular gland, the stomach, the appendix, the colon, and the esophagus. On that note, I'd like to stop here and uh, open the floor to questions, and I think there's some in the chat box here. <laughs>